Welcome to the Brains Magazine podcast, a podcast with in-depth interviews and conversations with world-class entrepreneurs, expert coaches, industry leaders, and international celebrities. Get exclusive insight into the world of business, mindset, leadership, and lifestyle with your host, Mark Sefton. I want to welcome you to the next episode of the Brains Magazine podcast. And today we are speaking with Adele Tevlin. Now, Adele is the founder of the CEO Blueprint. So I'm really excited actually for the next 30 minutes or so to dive a little deeper with Adele on all things in her wheelhouse. Adele, how are you today? I am very well. Thank you, Mark. I'm really excited about this. I'm really excited to to connect and chat and all things brains and <laughs> all things neuroscience, all, all the things life. Very excited. Yeah, I, it never gets old for me. I absolutely love speaking to people for so many different reasons. One, because I love human behavior. Two, because I believe if I ask great questions, then I can learn something and evolve and grow. And if I ask the right questions, that then everybody else that listens to this also has the ability to grow. And then if I'm drawing out of you the best, often I find that through talking things out, we often we often process and actually sometimes we almost create our own revelation just because somebody is given a space. A hundred percent. I find that's so true. Whenever I listen back to my own podcast recordings, let's say I'm here today and I'll hear myself back because when we're in it, we're in the flow, you know, hear myself back and I'll hear myself say something and it'll connect a dot for me. Like that's often my greatest teacher is listening back to myself Mm. and seeing something different, connecting something different. Like that's what I do is I love connecting dots. And often just in listening back to my own conversations with people, it's like my own therapy, you know, it's like Mm. to your point processing. We often think in words or we're thinking as we're speaking. So I think that the podcast platform is very powerful uh, for me, especially if you're an auditory learner like me, I can just like listen back and pick up on things. And so I love it. I'm looking forward to listening back to this. One. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it wild? Yeah. Isn't it wild? You know, when you're talking about connecting the dots, I can't remember yeah. who said it, but I love it. They said that life is understood uh, when you reflect on it backwards, but it's yeah. to be lived forwards. It's like a Steve, I think Steve Jobs was one of them who said, you can't connect the dots looking forward, only looking backwards. Yeah. Is so true. I know, isn't it? Isn't it wild? Like I, I love that. And uh, interestingly, yeah. like most people, kind of hate the sound of their own voice. <laughs> but <laughs> but I think I I think that you kind of get used to it in the end. I yeah. I remember listening to the very first radio show episode I ever did, and it was it was grim. Yeah. <laughs> I love the sound of your voice. I feel like the accent really just, you could say anything and it sounds good. <laughs> Bless you. Well, <laughs> so, sometimes I have joked actually, like when I've done a keynote and I've been like, you know, um, the great, the greatest thing about having an, an English accent is the fact that really I can pretty much say anything and I'll get away with it just because you, most of you will like this, like the sound of my voice. Very true. <laughs> the thing that, the thing that I'm excited about with you is is whenever I get to interview somebody who actually is breathing and living and working within arenas that I find fascinating, like then it then it is really hard to kind of contain the excitement. So yeah. <laughs> I wanted to start with asking you because it's something that I have an understanding of, but maybe other people don't. And sometimes I think it's really helpful to kind of define what something is. But what is a behavioral expert and pattern interpreter? And pattern interrupter or interpreter. I guess you could say it both ways. <laughs> yeah. So I, like you, you kind of said this at the beginning, have been obsessed with human behavior my whole life. Um, interestingly enough, I, I haven't really shared 
I've been really called to share more of my story lately. Um, I feel like we do this sometimes as leaders as well. We're, we'll share some parts vulnerably and some parts we feel afraid to share. But part of my, when I look back at that whole looking back, it didn't, it doesn't make sense looking forward, only looking back. I was always fascinated with human behavior. Um, you know, even as a kid, my mom would say to me, my parents would say, your friends would call and you'd be like on the phone with them, giving them advice, therapy, coaching <laughs> for hours at a time um, without pay. And I kind of sort of feel like I knew that this was, this was going to be the thing that I did in my life, but I didn't really know it then. I was a ballet dancer pretty much my whole life. And I was around women um, that had eating disorders. And that was just kind of standard par for the course back then. I didn't personally suffer from one, which is I always found interesting in and of itself. Like what about me made me more resilient or what about me and my childhood and my conditioning had it that that wasn't a problem for me. And then um, at the age of nine, I was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome. And back then there wasn't a lot of research, still still isn't. And uh, this is not something I publicly talk so much about, but it's something I'm really called to share because I believe it's one of those major dots that got connected for me. Mm. You know, I didn't want to go back then on the medication they were giving to kids with Tourette's was like lithium or some antipsychotic medications, crazy. And my mother used to take me to healers and, and you know, Eastern doctors, Western doctors, all the things. And again, one of those dots where it was like, I was always different. My brain, the neurodiversity of my brain was different. So I was fascinated. And then when I was in my teenage years, I had really severe scoliosis and I was wearing a back brace for four years while I was also competitively dancing. So again, another point that connected where it was like defying the odds or what was going on at the level of my brain. And then I was also suffering from migraines. As we talked about, I started getting these crazy migraines in my teenage years where it would be like a stroke symptom. It wasn't just like I have a headache. It's like, I can't speak. I can't, it's like aphasia. I can't, I can't connect a dot. So I was sort of like my own um, student my whole life because I didn't want to go the, the, the Western route all the time. I wanted to understand what was going on at the level of my brain? What was going on at the level of my patterns? Why was I experiencing these, these symptoms my entire life? And then I went to McGill University and I started studied in neuropsychology there. And I went to Harvard for a few semesters and I studied there and I started to accrue all of these sort of um, tools, Mark, but they were for my own use first. I was like, let's try NLP, let's try CBT, let's try DBT, let's try deep brain reorientation. Let's try, let's try. And I started to become this like, walking to your point embodiment of all the reasons, you know, most people in life, I, I believe, will kind of think of all the reasons why they can't do something. Well, I have scoliosis. I, I shouldn't be able to dance. I can't, you know, I shouldn't be able to do this because I have Tourette's or I shouldn't be able to do this because, and, you know, and doctors along the way would often tell me your daughter or tell my parents, your daughter probably won't be able to do this, or she probably will have trouble with this. And I was always, I don't know what it was inside of me, but I had this resiliency or this like belief in myself, Mark, that when someone told me I couldn't, mm. I would be like, let me show you how I can. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Sometimes it's gotten me into trouble, but <laughs> for the most, <laughs> oh yeah, you told me I can't. Okay. Let's see how this goes. And so I walk the walk with humility because I know that we all have in life limitations and we all have patterns and we all have childhood conditioning. And that's the, the root of my work as an inner child therapist, as a cognitive behavioral therapist. I do deep brain reorientation, which is essentially, um, it deals with attachment shock. It's really good for PTSD, um, something that I've overcome as well. I'm a mental health survivor. I had suicidal ideation in my university years. I've I've really, I feel like the universe, God, source, mother nature, has been like, let me give her all the things so that she can overcome them so that she can then teach it. Mm. That sort of feels like has been my call, my calling. And so I've only started more recently sharing all these pieces because, you know, I think in some ways there can be shame or embarrassment when you, you know, there's something wrong with you or that's how people would look at it. And we talk a lot about this as leader in leaders in different 
mastermind circles I'm in with women is that it's like you almost have to like appear perfect to people to feel like a leader. And my belief is actually when I'm vulnerable and fully authentic and I inhabit myself 100%, I give people permission to go, wow, like if she can do it, like I can do it, you know? Mm. There's, so, there's so much in there. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm like, I don't know if that answered your question. No, it did, it did but you gave me a buffet rather <laughs> okay, than- Okay, well, there you go. Cat. Um. But I love buffets, you know, all, yeah. all you can eat. Let's, uh, yeah. <laughs> let's go. Um, yeah, a couple of things that, hmm. something that I'm really aware of and just reflecting back. I believe that when people are vulnerable, it's actually showing that they're, they've either healed or they're mm -hmm. going through that healing journey because we yes. often can't speak about the things that we haven't faced or we haven't healed from. So I always think vulnerability for me, when, when people are vulnerable, I, I love it because it says to me mm -hmm. they've healed or they're healing, yeah. you know, and for me, I get, get jacked up by that. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is that mindset that you just said, because you mm -hmm. said, like, I believe that I've gone through so many, like, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, gone through so many challenging things, but I know it's so that I can, you know, bring a bring a lesson or be a lesson to, to others yes having that mindset is powerful because it really means that either life will be rosy for you and you can enjoy yeah. that and if it is difficult you just framed it in a way as this is just another area in which i can teach which is unbelievably 100%. powerful yeah well i i think it, it really if you look at what resiliency is um, is that it's this ability to say life is happening for me, not to me. Mm. You know, if we take the position of life's happening to me, which by the way, like I think along my journey, I've had those times where you feel like, can I survive this? Like, why does this keep happening? And we can tend to fall into victim consciousness in that place where we have no power over the situation. And then I think part of the healing for me has been, how is this happening for me? Mm. How is this serving my highest and best good? Well, I always say your mess is your message. I can sit here with honest honesty and talk to someone who's dealing with depression, anxiety, PTSD symptoms. And I could say, I totally understand what it feels like. You know, like I get, I get that feeling of despair. I get that feeling. But because I've been able to, like you said, reframe it and say, this is happening for me. It's happening for me now because now I can actually like lead people through really challenging times, not just intellectually. Like I read it from a textbook, like I've lived it. Mm. I wanted to ask a mm -hmm. little bit around behaviors and patterns. Often, oh yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, me too. O often we can fall into autopilot or, or maybe we don't fall into it. Maybe that's where we find ourselves most of the time. Um, how how do we increase our awareness of our default and be able to shift it from maybe a, a good thought process to a, to a great one? Or, yeah. yeah. So this is a great question. So patterns is like my whole thing. So patterns and behaviors to me is the is the root of everything. So I think it's important to distinguish what's a pattern because I think a lot of people don't always know. So a pattern is something that is repetitive, mm -hmm. compulsive, and dis often destructive, okay? So that's the key is when we have a pattern, it's not usually often a good healthy pattern, okay? Most of the patterns that we develop um, as children are in order to get our needs met or to secure survival in our family of origin. So usually when I say a pattern, what distinguishes the pattern is that it's destructive, compulsive, and repetitive. So it could be like a pattern of being of a being procrastinating, a pattern of being judgmental, a pattern of being critical, a pattern of being um, obsessive, a pattern of being vindictive to self or others. A pattern. You see where I'm going with this? So usually it, pattern. Yeah. I mean, they're all very negative patterns. Yes. Is it, can you give me some positive patterns? Well, patterns aren't, when we talk about patterns from like a neuroscientific perspective, mm -hmm. most patterns are negative. Okay. And when we frame them to be something that's positive, it's no longer, well, it's more of like a conscious shift in a pattern. So the pattern in and of itself is usually something negative. Okay. It's usually okay. something that's compulsive and it's negative. So 
I don't really often see people that have, people don't come to me and go, I have all these incredible patterns. They want to develop the ability to change a negative pattern into a positive behavior. So it's called a new way of being or a new behavior. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's say someone has a pattern of being, of, of procrastinating, right? Or leaving things off or being critical or judgmental with themselves. There's a healing process that has to happen where we discover, okay, like where did that pattern stem from? And you would say, well, where did you, so here's how patterns develop. This is the part that's so fascinating. And you, I'm sure already know this, but this would be for the listeners. Prior to the age of seven or eight, a child does not have a conscious mind. They only have a subconscious mind. So essentially what that means is the brain is in theta wave state, which is hypnosis. And the child is taking in everything from their environment. So feel, smell, sense, touch, emotions of the parents or caregivers, feelings, traumatic events, everything is going into the subconscious mind. And the the conscious mind or the intellect is not formed. So the child can't say, Mark, like, like I have an eight-year-old. So I, I, it's interesting. Like I view him from this angle where he, now he's eight. So he's starting to distinguish a bit more. But when he was seven, he couldn't be like, mom's freaking out because she's had a bad day at work. He's internalizing mom's freaking out. I must have done something wrong here. Okay. I may be bad and wrong. I'm now I'm scared. They, they internalize everything about themselves. Okay. So it's a me, I centered thing when you're a child mm -hmm. and the child is developing patterns or he's inheriting patterns by proxy of exactly what the parent is doing. So like if I'm um, an angry person, the, the child will become angry or they, they, the pattern is the opposite of the parent. So they rebel against the pattern or they accept the pattern a hundred percent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So why this is important for people is that how many times have you heard Mark people be like, I'm this way. They have this identity. Like I'm, I'm always late. It's like, no, that's a pattern. You, the you that is you, the I am is I am love. I am lovable. And I am, Love, I am loving. I am worthy. The I am is the authentic self. It's the spiritual self. It's the it's the I amness. I am late is not an I am. It's a pattern. Where did you learn to be late? Oh, my mom was always late to things. Okay, great. So you could see that that pattern belonged to your mom. Where did she get that pattern from? Well, her dad was always late. So you, when you go down, how many, how many generations do you go down? And I take people through this thought exercise where we actually start to um, go back and actually like review where the pattern came from. And then we go through a process where we discover that I am not my patterns, mm. which is very powerful. Mm. Like I am not late. I am not shy. I am not um, weak. I am not always scared right? Those are learned behaviors. And so I deal with people who doesn't matter what, how old they are or how educated they are. Cause I think sometimes we think, well, I'm, I'm really intelligent. I don't know why I keep doing this really destructive thing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, because the destructive thing, like you said earlier, 90% of our, of our mind is the subconscious mind. It's controlling everything. Mm -hmm. So when you're not even aware that you have these destructive patterns, you have it, that's just who you are, or that's just how life is. Mm -hmm. And what I've come to do with myself and people that I work with is actually heal those patterns like, and start to rewire the mind to start to change the behavior. So that's kind of how what you asked me is, okay, if I, if I don't want to be that way anymore, what's the new way of being and operating that I want to be? And then through spaced repetition over time, hopefully this isn't sounding like way too neuroscientific, <laughs> through spaced repetition over time, which is how the mind got programmed in the first place when you were seven, through spaced repetition over time, now we start to put in that new way of being, that new behavior through, through, through repetition. So now rather than showing up late all the time or procrastinating or being vindictive to yourself or being judgmental or critical or uh, whatever, you now choose a new way of being. Mm. And my, my understanding is our belief determines our behavior. So what we yeah. believe is true. 
Yes, exactly. But where does the belief come from? Yeah, belief comes from either what we've observed yeah. or, or past experience. You know, yeah, the, pa- is- the pattern. Yeah, I call exactly. it. Belief comes from the pattern, the programming, or the paradigm, the three P's. Yeah. Because that's the other thing. Like when you look at, if you really, it's it's kind of like an existential or like, it's a really interesting philosophical thing where people will be like, they'll, I'll ask them what they believe about something and they'll say, I believe whatever this is. Okay. If you actually question where, where did you, where did you get that belief? Like, a lot of people don't spend the time to question what they even believe, especially when it's not serving them. Mm. You know? Well, I, yeah. That's why. Like, we just we just walk around going, I believe this, and I believe this, and I believe this, and I believe this, and I believe that, you know, this. And it's like, cool. And I guess that's fine as long as it's serving your highest and best good. But when people, what I'm out to, what I do as a pattern interrupter and what I do as a mindset coach and therapist is I I look at the beliefs that the person has that are in conflict, Mark, with the life that they say they want. Mm. Okay. Because if you have beliefs that are in conflict with the results in life that you want, you're always, you know, what is that uh, link, uh, the quote that says a house divided against itself cannot stand. Right. So the mind will literally go, it will nullify. It'll be like, I'm confused. Like you say, believe this, but you want this. There's no order. Mm. Mm. one direction that i want to go in because i and the reason i want to go in this direction is because you have expertise on it but also from my reflection i don't think we've ever talked about on a brains podcast which is to do with money Mm. so you know i know that you help people with their relationship with money um what what are the what are the common problems that you're Mm -hmm. noticing here and then how how do we change our relationship with money? Oh, my God. I think we need 17 more episodes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not busy the rest of the day, are you? Okay. Um, <laughs> that's like, okay, I'll try to, I'll try to simplify this. Good luck. Yeah. Um, what are, so the first thing you asked is what are the common problems, problems. that people have? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that goes back to patterns, beliefs, behaviors, and paradigms. So for most people, when you say the word money, and I was one of these people too, by the way. So this is before I healed my whole relationship to money and really understood what it is. But most people believe that there's not enough. Okay, one thing. So there's not enough. They believe that it's hard to come by or it's hard to keep. They believe that people with money are bad. Like if I do like I do this thought exercise in one of my courses where I'll be like, finish my finish the sentence. People with money are right. Uh, Money doesn't grow on. And we know the answer to that. Again, it's like a belief thing. But where did you even learn the end of that sentence? A baby doesn't come into this world thinking that money is bad. Mm. So these are again, we heard our mom and dad talk about money a certain way. I have a money course actually. Um, and in my membership, and one of the women that was in there just commented, this was huge. This is These are the profound, I think, breakthroughs that people can get. Um, she said, I've, this is the third time I've watched this program, and I just got that money is not safe for me because I saw my parents fight about it, and it created a lot of chaos in my home. Mm. And she did like the brain explosion emoji. Mm. And So what happens is if the mind believes that money is not safe for you, it will do what? Push away opportunities for money. Mm. Mm. Or here's another angle that I think will blow people's minds. Because again, these are subtle nuances of how the mind works because the mind's always trying to keep you safe and the same. The subconscious mind is, is literally around pattern recognition. Even if the pattern is totally destructive and is totally not going to get you where you want to go, the subconscious mind doesn't care. It wants to keep you safe. So if it believes mom and dad used to fight about money, there was never enough. It created chaos. Maybe my dad cheated on my mom. Maybe this, they went bankrupt. The child now interprets, okay, money's not safe. Mm. So then growing up, all my clients, by the way, and people that I work with are very intelligent. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're naturopathic doctors. They're, they're, they got all the diplomas on their wall and they're going, why am I still like 
living paycheck to paycheck or why can't I blow past my need line or why, why am I like, I make money and then I spend it or I don't feel safe keeping it. And it's when we get to the root of it, Mark, it's always that as a child, the primary thing that the child wants to do is to secure the love of their parents and to feel safe. Mm. And when we grow up and we don't understand what money really is or how it moves or, you know, how to, how to, the, the laws around money, we, we believe that if we believe that money doesn't keep us safe, we're going to push it away. That's number one. Or another angle that I was just going to say is that if our parents struggled financially and our family of origin still does, some people will try to keep themselves small so mm-hmm. as to not leave behind mom and dad unconsciously. Okay. Mm-hmm. These are the two places I feel when I look at like the date, the data points, Mm -hmm. I would say either people are afraid to outgrow their parents and to leave them behind unconsciously. So they stay broke or they stay sick or they stay overweight, Mm -hmm. whatever it is that is in relation to mom and dad, Mm -hmm. or they saw money as a negative thing growing up or heard it was negative and no human being, I don't care who you are, no human being wants to be perceived as bad and negative. So they'll do anything they can to push it away. Mm. Those would be the two. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, It's great, isn't it? When you're able to like simplify something and and when it gives people like uh, clarity or like the penny drops. Yes. I find it so fascinating. Um, Yeah. How, how do we then change our relationship with money and how should we view money? Mm-hmm. So one thing I want to say before I answer that is that's part of, I think, when I looked at like, what is it about me that as a coach or a mentor that that is healing or helpful for people is I think that I can take pretty complex things and simplify them. Mm-hmm. Like, like the simplification is actually incredibly important because part of part of a lot of people's patterns, Mark, is they want to overcomplicate the shit out of things. Mm-hmm. Like I... Like, they'll be like, how can I make this really complicated so that it gives me permission not to have to change it? And I'm like, no, 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 this is actually really simple. This was your, this is what it was like for you growing up with your mom and dad. You developed a pattern that it's not safe to be seen or not safe to be wealthy or not safe to be happy or whatever it is. And you've spent your entire life through confirmation bias or dissonance theory to to staying in this same way. Okay. So that's actually what it is for everyone. And then you have your own specific situation. So to answer your question around how do people change or how do we heal? Well, that's part of the work that I teach is that there is a four step process to healing. Mm. The first is you can't heal what you're not aware of. So healing your money wounds is no different than healing um, any other trauma. Okay. So it could be like physical violence that happened to you or anything else. It's the mind is the same. It literally perceives it like a traumatic event. Mm. Um, So healing your money wounds or your beliefs around money is very much identifying like what the beliefs are. So awareness that you have these patterns and beliefs around money that are not your own. That is the key. They Mm. are not yours. You develop, you just, you um, inherited them from your caregivers. And that could be your grandparents or your parents, whoever raised you, whoever was around you. So that why that's important, Mark, to say they're not my own is it creates a shift from um, uh, like a consciousness shift where you're like, I'm, that's not mine. Those are not mine. I never chose those consciously. Mm. I didn't decide those were right for me. Okay. Mm. And then I believe in any healing work, you have to come to a place of compassion and forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we forgive, we forgive and we have compassion for the pattern. So I'm not my pattern. And I also can have compassion for my mom and my dad and use that actually that where before we press record around migraines and your mom having migraines gave you compassion, you know, for me. Right. And so compassion is so healing because it's like my parents did the best they could with the resources they had. They didn't, they weren't consciously trying to harm me for the most part. So compassion and forgiveness. I also think with pattern work, again, it's spaced repetition over time. So now identifying and having awareness, okay, I'm not my patterns. I'm not this scarcity. I'm not this fear. I'm not this. I'm, nothing bad is going to happen to me. And then it's like, what do we want to replace it with? So through, that's part of the work that I teach is this daily spaced repetition over time of the new behavior that you want to 
bring into your subconscious mind because the subconscious mind is only changed through space repetition over time, which is why it's not enough to listen to something once and go, yeah, I get it intellectually. That doesn't change anything at the level of the subconscious mind. So it's work. And, and people, I always joke, Mark, like, right, these days, I always like, I'm dating myself, but like these days I find like people want the seven step hack, the, the quick fix. They're like, tell me how to change my subconscious mind. It's like, well, you're going to have to work at it every day, probably for 90 days for you to really install a new way of being. Are you willing to do that? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, there's nothing you can't change. Mm -hmm. And then of course, the fourth step I think is in some cases, especially when we're dealing with severe trauma um, or people that have had really bad situations happen with money or otherwise, there has to be some form of somatic expression work. So meaning like getting it out of your body. Okay. So like I do this too, where I take people through a process where we move the energy and de-energize a lot of these patterns. Because a lot of these patterns live in our cells. They live in different organs. They live in different parts of our body. It could be shock, like like I said, um, attachment shock. So that happens at the level of the brainstem when something bad happens to you as a kid. And you it's sort of like, you know, when you see a, an animal mark go through trauma, but they shake it out. Mm -hmm. Humans don't do that. We retract when something happens and then we hold that energy. So a lot of the work that I teach is like, we're dealing with kind of all parts of ourselves. We're dealing with the brain, the mind, different parts of the brain, but then we're also dealing with the body. Like what, where is that energy feel stored inside of you? And let's de-energize it, express it out of us so that we can let go of those patterns altogether. So I, I sort of have this process that I take people through in my work where it's very powerful because it really is dealing with all parts of the mind and the brain at the same time. Mm. I like when I like when you said about sh and how an animal shakes out. Because yeah, I, I, all of a sudden, you know, I could see a cat. I could see it. Yeah, I dog. could see a deer. Like yeah. I, yeah. like when yeah. it got a, a near miss with a cheetah, and I, you know, you, you see it shake itself. Yeah, so that was interesting. Um, it shakes. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, just because I yes. just may need a little bit more definition Clarity. you talk mm. you talk you talked about space repetition yeah. like what does that mean exactly yeah very good <laughs> okay i love this this is like i love geeking out on this and i love when other people want to know <laughs> so when you think about let's go back to this analogy of a child under the age of seven or eight does not have a conscious mind so they don't have the intellect all they have is what we call the subconscious mind or the emotional mind. And the subconscious mind is deductive, Mark. So what that means is it takes in everything as fact. Okay. There's no like, I agree, disagree. This makes sense. Doesn't make sense. It just goes in. And when you think about, if you even go back to your childhood for a second, and you think about what were the things that you heard, saw, experienced repetitively, Okay. So for example, if your parents, um, if your parents were short tempered, let's say they likely weren't just short tempered once this was a pattern. So you experienced things through spaced repetition over time. So it was like, it happened, then it happened again and it happened again. There was a repetition through time, right? Mm -hmm. Or the subconscious mind gets, um, uh, the subconscious mind gets wired through um, sudden emotional impact. So meaning like a car accident, the death of a loved one. So something that was a trauma that happened like boom once. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's how the mind got locked where it is now when you were a kid. So when people are trying to change the neuroplasticity of the brain in their twenties, thirties, forties, whatever, we have to do it in the same way that it was done then. We have to approach it at the same level. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So spaced repetition over time. So meaning like, let's say I want to believe that success is easy for me. Okay. Or like um, money is safe. It's safe to have money as we're using money as an example. I would repeat that statement over and over again to my subconscious mind when my brain is in theta wave state. So before better or in the morning. 
or in a, or if I put myself in a hypnotic state, because the brain is now going, okay, it's safe to receive money, but it's in that theta wave state. And I'm doing this through space repetition over time. So I'm saying it, I'm repeating it. I'm repeating it in intervals. That's what it means for space repetition over time. Yeah. So you, so you can see how to that point, um, a lot of people on the internet, I think these days, I think this is where it can be a bit, I don't want to say dangerous, but I would proceed with caution to people. You want to make sure that when you're working at the level of your subconscious mind, you're doing it with someone that really knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's not like a seven step TikTok hack, or you did some weekend course and you're an expert, like with all due respect, the brain and the mind are incredibly powerful things. And you want to make sure that you're working with someone that is trained, is qualified, is specialized, has years of experience with all kinds of people, because I've seen it where, you know, people will do like a course for a weekend and they're like, oh, I'm trained in something and they can do damage unconsciously or consciously. Mm, Yeah. So I'm a big proponent of that because I feel like everybody these days, you know, they, they go to some seminar and then they're an expert. (laughs) And I'm And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't want to date myself here. I'm 43 years old, but I've been doing this since I was 21. Yeah. Definitely. I feel like there needs to be regulation of Mm -hmm. plenty of things that aren't. But I mean, again, we could do another podcast. We've only got a a few moments left, but I always like to give space, Adele, for just uh you to be able to share anything intuitively that you feel we haven't touched on or that you really just sense needs to be said in in just a couple of moments if you can yeah sure Mm. i truly believe mark that the mind is the most powerful if you want to call it organ you know the mind the brain i think you know it's no coincidence we're not talking about the brains podcast but Mm. i've been studying the brain for 23 years and it is so powerful and i say that in a positive way meaning that i truly believe no matter what has happened to you in your life for the listener whether it was a traumatic childhood or the death of of a loved one or you know anything that has been traumatizing we've all gone through different kinds of traumas in our life big t or little t trauma i truly believe that the brain is the most powerful organ and it can change itself and it can heal and anything is possible for people if they truly desire that change. Like I always say, I'm really for the person who's ready for real change. Like this is not a seven step hack. This is going to require work and energy on your part. But I truly believe if I've been able to heal my own traumas and my own PTSD and mental health stuff and my you know, manage my Tourette's without medication and heal my scoliosis, never had to have surgery, like all the things that, you know, if you were to look, if I were to look at myself in my 20 year old version of me, I would have never thought this was possible for me. You know what I'm saying? Like I really didn't. So I believe that everybody has the ability to heal and to change if they really want it. Mm, I love that. Yeah. How do people then find out more about you and and their, and your work? Where, where do they go? Well, Instagram is where I hang out, <laughs> not TikTok. <laughs> I'm too old for TikTok. So my Instagram is at Adele underscore Tevlin. And I am in there. I respond to DMs. I love communicating with people. I share lots of great things, you know. So um, and the links in my bio on my Instagram share all the ways to work with me. My membership is a great place for people to start. There's always, always things going on. Um, so that would be where they can find me. Yeah. I was gonna say Adele. Um you saying that you're too old for TikTok is a pattern. <laughs> Touche. Touche, yes. No, okay, I'm going to reframe it. I'm too wise for TikTok. <laughs> oh, funny. You know? Yeah, yeah. No. But I do love I do love hanging out on Instagram. So that is where you can find me if you, if you want to learn more. But I really do want to leave people with this belief that like I've, I've seen it all. I've heard it all. And I've seen people have the greatest transformations and reclaim 
their life and it's not, you're never too old. It's never too late, you know? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Never too old, never too late for TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just buried exactly. yourself a bit more there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's been really good to catch up with you. I've really enjoyed yes, it. And thank, thank you. you so much. I have too. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you for joining this episode with me, Max Sefton. I hope you've really enjoyed it. Feel free to leave us a positive review on iTunes. And I look forward to welcoming you back to the next episode of the Brains Magazine podcast.